Just want to give you a quick little update on what's going on with Laundry Love. I want to give you a quick little story, quick little testimony from one of the Laundry Loves a couple months back. There was uh, one man that uh, came up, um, he kind of just approached and just not really giving us much attention. I said, hey man, we'd love to cover your laundry today. No strings attached, we just want to pop some quarters and machines and hear some detergent. He looked at me and he's like, dude, there ain't nothing for you in life. What are you talking about? Definitely very reluctant at first. And he came back out later and he's like, actually, I'm short one quarter. Can I have it? Uh, but I think we really softened his heart a little bit just knowing that like we wanted to give. We didn't want to get anything in return. We just wanted to give and help him clean his laundry that night. Um, but I just wanted to thank, first off, thank everybody that has been there on the second Tuesday of each month. Um, and um, just, just knowing that the people are there serving, that's great. But we also really do actually need some uh, giving online towards it. Some financial support would be great. Um, remember, you can give through anthemdenver.org backslash serve. Um, and, and the Anthem Denver app is also very helpful. But remember, Jesus did not come to be served, but he came to serve. That's really an awesome uh, thing to remember. And uh, as we go and we serve together, uh, we meet together on the second Tuesday of each month. Uh, we hand out detergent. We popped some quarters in the machines and we hand out some snacks and we had some actually some hot chocolate one that one Tuesday when it snowed um, And we hang out with the people we get to, to, to chat with them and get to know them um, Just share God's love with them in a practical way. So we look forward to seeing you all the next one is October 13th Hope you can be there, uh, but either way we would appreciate any donations you can give online But we're really looking forward to next time. Thanks guys so much. We'll see you next time How have your conversations surrounding the topic of politics been going? How have your conversations in politics been going for you lately? Because I, I don't know about you, but I really sense such disunity, such tension and anger in our country right now. And, and I even sense a lot of that within the church. I have a good friend who told me uh, recently that because of the last four to eight years, the presidency of, of Barack Obama through now uh, President Trump, uh, because of the politics of the last eight years, my friend says he basically has no relationship with his family any longer. He said, we can't talk. He says, no matter, no matter what, it always kind of uh, leads back to the topic of politics and it has broken his family apart. This is insane. And I, I don't think my friend is the only person that's experiencing that kind of thing. Family is being broken. Some families, because of this conversation topic of politics, I think friends and, and relationships are, are being changed and there's, there's tension for many of our relationships and some are even being broken because of this topic. We sometimes even think, I don't know if I can invite that person over because you know, they're a supporter of fill in the blank. There's real division happening right now. And at the same time, there is also echo chambers and, and, and tribalism happening. More of us are developing these, these little uh, relationships where, where everyone around us seems to believe the same thing. We unintentionally or maybe even intentionally, some of us, create environments where we only encounter information and opinions that reflect and reinforce our own opinions. That's not a good thing, by the way. That's not like a way towards progress. That's not a way for us to learn and understand the world if everyone around us just believes the exact same thing. That's also not a Jesus way, by the way. Uh, I mean, you can see Jesus constantly throughout the gospel surrounding himself with people who are different, who think different. We're not just supposed to be robots. And so maybe some of you are not experiencing any tension because You've surrounded yourself with all the same people. I would say, I think we would all agree that right now the division is 
real. I, I can't remember a time in my lifetime, I'm only 35 years old, but I can only, I, I can't remember a time that has been like right now, not even uh, during the Iraq war, not even post 9-11, right now feels markedly different. It feels like uh, things aren't going great. And this is painful to me because I love the church. I love Jesus' vision for the church. When Jesus talks about the church, when you see the church in the book of Acts, loving one another, selling things for one another, having all things in common, that's how Acts 2.42 talks about the church, that they had all things in common. When I think about the church of right now, it makes me incredibly sad, even angry in a sense. I can't believe that those of us who follow Jesus are being pulled apart by something as ridiculous as politics. But it's, it is, it's happening. I, I think a lot of you can see that this is happening. And so the question is, what are we supposed to do? The question I think really is, is, is how are we supposed to engage with politics as Jesus followers? This is the question I think so many Christians are trying to figure out right now in America. What is the Jesus way to engage with politics? What's the Jesus way uh, to have a political conversation? Is there a good way? Is there a bad way? And so, here is my framework for today going forward. The framework for, for what we're doing today, I want to give it to us and, and try and make it as simple and understandable as possible. First off, I want to give a basic foundation for how the scriptures view government. Basically, what does the Bible say about government and politics? Second, I want us to ask the question, what might God say into our current American political situation? What might God say to America's politics of right now? And then thirdly, I just want us to land and I want us to ask the question again. Therefore, what should our response be as Jesus followers? How should Jesus followers respond to politics? How do we engage? And so first off, what does the Bible say about government? And so go ahead and turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 12. I think the best place for us to start is with Jesus. Jesus actually has a conversation with some Pharisees and, and some Herodians about government. Believe it or not, there's politics in the Bible. All right, Gospel of Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 13, it says this. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and, the, and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. By the way, they're obviously buttering Jesus up uh, just so that they can try and make him look foolish. Anyway, continue. They ask him this question. They, says, they say, is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and, asked, and, and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. So here we have a moment in the Gospels where Jesus, who is God in the flesh, by the way, this is God. We have a moment here in the Gospels where Jesus is having a conversation about how to respond to government. I mean, this is, this is great. This is so directly to the point. What should we do with government? Well, Jesus speaks directly into it. And I, I think just from this conversation alone, <coughs> excuse me, 
<coughs> we can understand a few things about what God thinks about government. And so I, I actually want you to stop the video, pause it right here, and I want you to, to discuss with your neighbor, go back through Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17, and mainly uh, verses 15 through 17. And I, ju I just want you to ask yourselves this question. What does this, this scripture tell us about God and government? What, what does this scripture tell us possibly? I mean, uh, use your imagination. What does this scripture tell us about God and his perspective on government, his perspective on politics, how, should, how we should view politics? So pause the video here and chat with your neighbor. Go for it. All right. Okay. Well done. I hope you got something out of uh, your conversation with your neighbor. Probably depends on your neighbor. Um, but here's a few things uh, that I see from this passage in Mark 12. First of all, pretty obvious, we should pay our taxes. Jesus uh, is not at all arguing that we shouldn't pay our taxes. So if you were hoping today that you would get out of paying taxes, I'm sorry. Uh, Jesus is uh, for paying your taxes if that's what your government asks you to do. Secondly, God wants us to obey the governing authorities. More on that in a minute. Third, a simple observation here. God is not anti-authority. In fact, the way that Jesus answers the Pharisees' questions here, their question, I think it's genius. Look at this. The Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus. It even says that in, in Mark 12 there. The Pharisees are trying to trap him. And they're trying to trap Jesus into saying one of two things. On one side of the trap, they're trying to get Jesus to say something to the effect of, well, we don't really need to obey and follow earthly authorities. No, you don't need to pay taxes. The Pharisees hoped he might say something like that. And if Jesus had said that, the Pharisees would immediately have called the Roman guards over and said, Jesus here is teaching treason. What he's teaching is rebellious. He's teaching that, that uh, we shouldn't obey the authorities. They would have had Jesus arrested immediately. That's one side of the trap. And on the other side of what the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus into, they were trying to get Jesus to say something to the effect of, yes, you need to fully obey Caesar, in which the Pharisees would have then called Jesus a heretic and they would have said, so you're telling us that we need to be worshipers of Caesar and not of God. But Jesus' response, as per usual, is perfect. Jesus says to them, again, looking at verse 15, halfway down, uh, he says, bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and, and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? And you can imagine the Pharisees are holding a, a coin and, and they say, well, oh, this is Caesar's picture on the coin. And then Jesus said to them, well, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. This is so important for how Jesus followers view government. Jesus is saying, put government in its proper place. Okay, sure. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to Caesar what he has authority over. But give to God what is God's. Jesus doesn't fall for the trap. He doesn't say, yeah, we, should, we need to go worship Caesar because the government told us to. Jesus doesn't say that. But he also doesn't say we are anti-authority and, and we should not pay taxes. Jesus says this strange other thing. Give to Caesar what is Caesar. Give to God what is God's. What we need to take from this 
is that when we put earthly leaders, earthly authorities in their right place, we can, we can submit and obey. We're actually called to, and we'll see this so much throughout the letter of 1 Peter. We're called to submit to the authorities that have been put over us. You don't like your boss at work. Well, tough luck. That's an authority over your life. You don't like your teacher at school. Well, God says that's an authority over your life. You need to obey them and listen to them. But the amazing thing as we follow God, as we follow Jesus, is that even if we have a terrible boss. We have a ter- if we have a terrible earthly leader, a terrible president. I mean, think about the countries around the world where they have the most rotten uh, rulers. They have the most totalitarian and even evil authorities ruling a government. This here, this understanding that Jesus gives us is that as we submit as we obey that earthly authority, we're only giving them the authority that has been allowed to them. We're not giving them anything more. And as we submit to them, we're actually really, we're trusting God. We're looking past the earthly leader. We're saying, you know what? At the end of the day, I I trust God, who's the ultimate and final authority. And it's God who I'm trusting. I'm actually trusting him more than I'm trusting this earthly leader. And, and I can actually make it through even a corrupt earthly authority because I trust God. And I know that in the, in, in the end, God has my best interest. God has my eternity secured. God has an inheritance for me secured in, in heaven, in eternity. And so real quick, just a couple of, I'm going to make some, some quick uh, bullet points here. Uh, a couple bullet points on God and government. I'm going to try to work through this quickly. Number one, God instituted government for the good of all people. God created government. This is really his kind of uh, creation. Romans 13 verses 1 and 2 says this. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. And we see here God is is more or less pro the idea of government. God is pro-structure. God is not for chaos. He's for order. Government is, is God's idea. It's a good thing. Second point on God and government from the scriptures. Government is meant to provide earthly justice and perfection. Uh, protection, excuse me, not perfection. Uh, provide earthly justice and protection. Uh, look at 1 Peter. This is from uh, the letter we're going through. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14 says this. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. God means... For earthly authorities to bring justice. We think in the modern day that that justice is our idea. Well, this is actually God's idea. God is the one who wants justice. He wants evil to be eradicated. And, and, And God actually hopes and intends for even earthly governments to bring justice. And protection to to those who who can't be protected, the oppressed, the poor, the needy. God wants the government to bring oversight. Um, This is what a godly government would do. Number three, government is meant to act on behalf of the good of all people. Like all people. This third point is rooted in 
in this idea from Genesis chapter 1. It's called Imago Dei. Imago Dei is a Latin phrase that means the image of God. And the, the idea of the Imago Dei is that, that all humans are created in God's image and therefore uh, all humans are, are value, valuable, all humans are, are equal. Uh, there's not like a hierarchy of some humans are better, some who are, are lesser or worse. In this Imago Dei theology, we believe that, that all humans are made in God's image. Image. This is our basis that, that everyone is created equal. All humans uh, should have rights. They should be so valued. And because God values them this way, we should value every human this way. And so therefore, governments should be ordered under the Imago Dei theology. And this theology, by the way, it, it just runs through the whole Bible. I, I mean, you see it everywhere that God values all people. He gets angry when oppressed and needy people are not valued and, and not given a way to, to prosper. This, this is a struggle in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I would even argue, and, and many scholars would agree, that, that it almost feels in the scriptures as though God's main concern is for usually for the oppressed people of earth. I mean, think of, of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. God really cares for all people in all types of situations. Number four, earthly governments are temporary and they have limitations. This is so important. Uh, think of, of, if you know the story of the Tower of Babel, it's from Genesis 11. There's a people in Babel. They're attempting to build a kingdom that they would, they're hoping would live forever. It would, would encompass and rule over all the earth. Uh, and you, they say, you know, within the, 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 the Tower of Babel moment as they're building this tower into the heavens, uh, they believe that they will, will go on forever into eternity. And in this Genesis 11 moment, God ends their authority and he scatters them. And think about this. We've never seen a kingdom or a government in all of history, by the way, that that hasn't eventually fallen. There's never been a government or a kingdom or a nation that has gone on forever. There's never been a government or a kingdom that, that's taken over everything and ruled over everything. Um, God will not allow earthly governments to get to that point, to get to the point of, of ruling and reigning for eternity, for, forever. The scriptures actually promise us that no earthly kingdom will ever uh, be that way. That is only reserved for Jesus' kingdom, for the kingdom of God. Jesus' kingdom will have final authority. This is, this is strange to think about because this is, this is so political. I mean, there's a sense where you could think of the whole Bible as speaking of God's politics, of Jesus' politics, and that Jesus' government will come in in finality and it will actually rule forever. And, and Jesus' ways, his policies, if you will. They are the thing that, that the universe at the end of all things will have to submit to. Listen to Revelation 15 verse 4. It says this, Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. Revelation 19.16 says, On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is the politics of Jesus. Jesus is 
the king of all kings. He's, he's the Lord of all lords. He, he's the final president of all presidents who will rule and reign on into eternity. And really, so the Bible takes us to this point of when are you going to finally realize Jesus, this good king, he has come, he's established his kingdom. When are you going to get on board? And by the way, when you think about especially the, the Tower of Babel, where, where God comes and he says, no, you will not build uh, this arrogant kingdom that will last forever, and he crushes them, doesn't it seem that God hates an arrogant nation? A nation that thinks that they might also be an eternal ruling kingdom. A nation that thinks they might be ruling and reigning over the whole world rather than God. I will tell you, I, I believe the scriptures show that God is not fond of an arrogant earthly kingdom. I mean, just got to realize Babylon is gone. Rome eventually fell in their insane arrogance and no one thought that the world could stop Rome. At that point, I'm, I'm sure everyone believed that, yes, Rome will be the world government, but they're done. In Genesis 11, God crushes the kingdom of Babel in his own righteous anger because they thought way too highly of themselves. And so just a side thought for a moment. Is, is it really our calling as a nation to think super highly of ourselves? Do we possibly ever step into arrogance, thinking that we're the end all be all? And and so this, this brings me to my, my, the second portion uh, of, my, uh, of our, my, my teaching today. And it's this question. What do we think that God might say to our current American political situation? What do you think? Like if you were to really think and ponder for a moment, what do you think God might say to the current American politics? Think about this for a moment. Because I want to share what I think God might think. And I, I really want to emphasize that he might think. I, I, I always want to be careful uh, to not say that, that I know exactly how God feels about something. But I will say this is something that has been stirring in my soul. I think that God might be saying to us who are currently in the, the American election cycle of the year 2020, I think he might be saying, you shall have no other gods before me. This is, this is from Exodus 20. This is the first of the 10 commandments. I, I think God might be saying or thinking or feeling to the American people, to especially the church, you shall have no other gods before me. God says, no other gods but me. He has no problem saying this. Possibly, maybe another way to say this would be, you know what, America, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is already God's. Give God your life. Give God your worship. Give God your expectations, your hopes, your dreams. Give God your political hopes and dreams. Listen to Exodus 20, uh, verse 1 through 6. I want you to hear the whole thing. It says, And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Is it possible that we are replacing our hope that should be in God's kingdom in a very weak and lesser kingdom of American politics? 
Is it possible that many of us are worshiping and bowing down to, to the gods of, of conservative ideology or we're bowing down to the gods of, of liberal, progressive ideology? Do we maybe sometimes have thoughts like, if we just elected the right person, we might be saved? I think there's this constant and subtle lie in this country that, that we're on the verge of something like a, a utopia. If only we passed that one law. If only we elected that official. Um, if only we brought in that president rather than that president. Maybe if we just fought harder and argued more fiercely for our political God, then we would be saved. Then, then we might achieve something that would, would look like the kingdom of God right here in America. And we wouldn't even need Jesus to do it. I think, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm being way too bold here, but I, I really think we want the kingdom of God without the king. We think we're going to usher in kingdom of God like world here and now without Jesus at all. I believe that we think we're building our own utopian kingdom here and now. And we do this all through, through rage and opinion on Facebook. We build, uh, we're, we think we're building uh, the kingdom through Instagram stories where we look to just passive aggressively make a dig at our conservative friends or Possibly uh, we uh, post on, on Facebook some kind of uh, proof text post that shows how wrong our liberal friends are. And, and then all the while never having an actual conversation face to face. How is this building the kingdom of God? I think rather we are worshiping false idols. I think many of us are 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 coming to that point. We're looking to something so much lesser, so much weaker to save us. I think we're worshiping and we are worshiping with such passion. Bob Dylan wrote uh, from his album, by the way, it's a slow train of coming. Uh, Bob Dylan wrote a song with chorus uh, from that album. It says, you're gonna have to serve somebody. Yes, you are. You're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Love that. Timothy Keller, a uh, pastor in New York City, says something similar to Bob Dylan. He says, you don't get to decide to worship. Everyone worships something. The only choice you get is what to worship. Philosopher James K.A. Smith, he says this, from, it's from his book that's incredible. I could not recommend it enough. Uh, it's called You Are What You Love. Uh, Smith says this, Your deepest desire is the one manifested by your daily life and habits. This is because our action, our doing, bubbles up from our loves, which are habits that we've acquired through the practices we're immersed in. That means the formation of my loves and desires can be happening under the hood of consciousness. I might be learning to love something that I'm not even aware of and that nonetheless governs my life in unconscious ways. I think this is happening in our political uh, American political system of the moment. Smith says this uh, elsewhere in his book. He says, Jesus is a teacher who doesn't just inform our intellect, but forms our very loves. He isn't content to simply deposit new ideas into your mind. He is after nothing less than your habits, your wants, your loves, your longings. Jesus' command to follow him is a command to align our loves and longings with his. To want what God wants, to desire what God desires, to hunger and thirst after God and crave a world where he is all in all. A vision encapsulated by the shorthand phrase, the kingdom of God. All humans are worshipers. 
So what is it that you are giving your hopes, your dreams, your longings, and your worship to? What are you giving your political hopes and dreams and longings over to? We are worshipers in this society. And I would argue that we attend to public worship every day inside the temple of the news media and the social media where we perform our rituals and we state our creeds with religious vigor. We state our creeds boldly so that other followers of, of the way that we follow would know where we stand. So other followers of liberalism would see that we've recited our creed and we're performing our rituals and, and they would recognize us and understand where we stand. So that other uh, religious uh, right-wing uh, people would see where we stand as we recite our creeds and, and we live out our rituals in the way of, of uh, republicanism or liberalism in, in democratic politics. We state our creeds boldly. Many of us listen to the high priests who are preaching their sermons to us. But these high priests, they don't just preach on Sunday for, for 30 minutes like me, maybe longer today. These high priests are preaching every single day and night of the week inside the temples of MSNBC and Fox News. I, I hope you understand where I'm going with that. We have high priests who are just preaching to us the ways of, of liberal and conservative and, and directing our hopes and our dreams to the God of liberalism and conservatism. Uh, every day, we are our worshipers and many of us we have set our hope we've set our sights on what I would call I believe our silly pathetic gods who will not deliver what what, what we think they will deliver I mean think of the way that presidents campaign even in the first place I mean, I, I have to say, I loved the, the Obama campaign. As his picture just looked so cool and it just said hope. It just seemed so rock star. Whether you like Barack Obama or not, I'm just talking about his campaign. It was, it was so interesting. It just, it felt so young and, and modern. And, and then you have uh, President Trump. His campaigning is make America great Again, it's such a powerful phrase. These are messianic in their, in their ways. These, these are preaching to us. Do you want hope? Well, look to this man. Do you want to see this nation made great again? Do you want something like the kingdom of God again? Well, look to this president. There's a book called uh, The Cult of the presidency and the big idea of the book is that we in America have traded our our old values of, of Christianity for looking to the presidency to be our hope and to be our religious hope we're intense with this and with all of this I, I could feel many of you thinking okay Josh maybe maybe I'm tracking with you maybe you're not but Josh, are you, are you saying that, that we shouldn't care about politics? Are you, are you saying that we shouldn't vote? And actually, absolutely not. But I am saying we have to put everything in its proper place. We have to put government and the president of the United States in their proper place. Again, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God's? Put Caesar where he's meant to be. Caesar's just a human. The president is just a human. And we need to see that God is God. As Jesus followers, we don't worship created things. We worship the creator. We don't hope for created things to give us salvation. We put our hope in the Creator for our final hope and salvation. This is what sin is. 
Sin is inverting and misunderstanding creator and created. When we make created things into gods, they will always destroy us. When we, when we make good things into gods, those things destroy us. This makes so much sense, I think, when we think about sex. Sex is good. God created sex. Sex is meant to be something that humans enjoy. God created this, but it's meant to be put in its right place. God has given order and boundaries to the way that sex is meant to be practiced uh, within humanity. It has to be in its right place. It's a created thing. But when sex becomes our God, it, it will tear up our world. Sex has absolutely torn up our world. I mean, you just think of the human trafficking industry that, that just ravages our world and just the devastation, the horror uh, where, where sex has been made God. And, and because sex is a God, it's, it's okay to, to terrorize young people and, and take their dignity and take their imago Dei. God hates that. It's so horrible. Sex is good, but sex makes for a terrible God, and it will destroy us when we make it God. Enough about sex. Just the same, an earthly government can be a good thing. God has initiated government for our good, but our government and our president makes for a terrible God. When we're looking to our president and for our government to save us, this will leave us continually longing for so much more. It's going to leave us empty. We're going to find that we've been worshiping a false god. And I, I think this is exactly what is happening to us right now. Again, I mean, you can disagree with me. Um, that's fine. Andrew Sullivan, uh, in his article in New York Magazine, uh, has a, a uh, article titled America's New Religions, and he says this. If your ultimate meaning is derived from religious faith, you have less need of deriving meaning from politics or ideology or trusting entirely in a singular secular leader. By the way, Andrew Sullivan is definitely not a Christian, but this he believes this. Uh, this article is fascinating. I definitely recommend it. He says, it's only when your meaning has been secured that you can allow politics to be merely procedural. So what happens when this religious rampart of the entire system is removed? The need for meaning hasn't gone away. But without Christianity, this yearning looks to politics for satisfaction. And religious impulses, once anchored in and tamed by Christianity, find expression in various political cults. Now look at our politics. We have the cult of Trump on the right, a demigod who among his worshipers can do no wrong. And we have the cult of social justice on the left, a religion whose followers show the same zeal as any born-again evangelical. They're filling the void that Christianity once owned without any of the wisdom and culture and restraint that Christianity once provided. At least for me, I really just sense that the Lord has been saying to me, I, I think the Lord is looking at where we're at right now, saying, you shall have no other gods before me. Stop looking to politics as Savior. I trust Jesus. I don't want my heart to be wrapped up in, in hope that I, I think will fail in, in a political party, that, that a political party would deliver us. I don't want to bow down to a lesser God. And I, and I just want to plead with you, don't bow down. Look to, to Jesus. Look to our final king. Look to our king who is ruling and reigning. He is good now. And so this leads me to the last part uh, of today, and it's, it's shorter, I promise. 
Therefore, how are we supposed to respond to all of this as, as Jesus followers? And I've had this conversation with so many of you, and, and, and so often it leads to this point. I, I hear people say, Josh, are you saying that we should be apolitical? Josh, are you just saying that we shouldn't vote? Are you saying we should just like uh, just stop caring? Is, is that what you're trying to argue? And I just want to say no. I'm definitely not saying that you should be apolitical. But I, but I also have to say it does kind of depend on, on what you might mean by apolitical. If by apolitical you mean being someone that, that just doesn't care at all, where you look at your world and your neighborhood and you look at the issues of the world and you just say, ah, I, I don't care. I, I think there's no way that the, the scripture should lead you to, to a place of just complete apathy as to what happens in the world. In fact, it, it should be the exact opposite. If that's what you mean by apolitical, then yeah, for sure, don't be apolitical. But if I, a, by apolitical, you mean that you are not dedicated and committed to the left or that you're not dedicated and committed to the right, that your first commitment and your primary allegiance is not to a political party, then maybe if that's what you mean by apolitical, like you maybe mean like midway political or, or kind of in between, um, and that you don't have this crazy allegiance to uh, being a, a Democrat or a Republican or a Libertarian or whatever, then maybe, maybe I do mean that. If by apolitical you mean uh, that you refuse to bow to the cult of, of personality, that you refuse to bow to the cult of the presidency in our country, uh, then maybe, maybe I mean that you should be apolitical. If by apolitical, you mean that you want to attempt to follow Jesus wherever his ethics take you and that you won't be guided by a partisan political line, but instead you are wildly dedicated to, if Jesus says I veer this way with economics, then I do because Jesus said so. If Jesus says that I veer this way because of the Imago Dei and caring for the oppressed and the poor, then I, then I veer this way. If that's what you mean by apolitical, it may not be what you mean by apolitical, but if that is what you mean, then, then maybe, yeah. I, I'm not sure what you might mean when people say apolitical. I, I'm not sure. Um. I, I just think that we need to follow Jesus wherever he goes, wherever he takes us. How are we supposed to engage in politics as those who follow Jesus? Uh, well, well, I would say also in one sense that we should be the most political people on planet Earth. The word politics in Greek is politica, and it actually means the affairs of the city. And in that sense, we should be most concerned of all people with the affairs of the city. What's going on in your world, your neighborhood? We care. We love Jesus, and Jesus loves the world. Should we be political? Well, I would also say too often we think of, of being political as just being opinionated. And so in that way, yeah, don't be political if it just means be opinionated. And we also think of, of being political as just someone who, who dominates a dinner party and just wants to talk about uh, the different things that presidents have said. Uh, again, I, I think our country is way over uh, obsessed with the president. The president matters. But, but being political, if all that is, if all that means is that you just care about voting every four years for the president, then yeah, that's kind of dumb. But if politics is about the affairs of the city, caring about your neighbors, caring about what goes on in and around your, your county and in your city, and, and when you see the homeless, in the needy, in the pressed, in the city of Denver, and your heart aches, and, and you want to pray, Jesus, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. If that's political, then we should be the most political people on planet earth. Again, I, I love that, the politica. 
the affairs of the city. We're so repulsed, I think, some of us by the idea of politics because it so often is someone who is annoying and, and they're, they're dominating with wanting to push their opinions on other people. Being political often means just opinionated. <laughs> but we care about our country. We care about people. We care about every human being. As, every, as Jesus followers, we, we want every human being to be given value and dignity. We are driven by the Imago Dei. And the weird and strange thing of right now is that sometimes the liberal left defends the Imago Dei and sometimes the conservative right defends the Imago Dei. And so what do we do? Well, I just say first and foremost, you don't bow down to either. Neither left or right fully comprises the, com the kingdom of God. Neither liberal or conservative is a holistic view of Jesus' vision for the world. You have to admit that. If you can't admit that neither the left or the right is a full holistic view of what Jesus wants for the world, then you're really not paying attention. You're really not reading the scriptures. And so I know, I, I, I can feel the question, Josh, then what are we supposed to do? I don't feel like I have a great answer, but this is what I have. You pray. We should be people who pray for our country. We should want good for those in our neighborhoods. I, I think you resist bowing to one political party. We're all in a broken human system. There's not one political system, one earthly political system that has all of the answers. There's not one political, I know some of us just think, man, capitalism, it just solves so much. Or believe, like if we just had a democratic socialism, that that would really just, but neither of those fully answers what God, God's kingdom is asking. And neither fully work because, because both democratic socialism and capitalism, neither of them have King Jesus fully overseeing them. And we have to admit that. We resist bowing to one political party. We all work within this broken human system that we find ourselves in. I, I think some of you Maybe, maybe should go work within the Democratic Party and, and you work tirelessly to turn it towards kingdom of God value. Some of you should go infiltrate the Democratic Party. Some of you should go work within the Republican Party to turn it towards kingdom of God values. And don't just either on either side, don't be a person that just buys into the party line. We can't. We cannot. It, they're broken. They need Jesus. Neither side fully represents God. Not even close. If you don't understand that, I'd love to talk to you uh, privately. Seriously, send me a text. Uh, I have a lot to say. Both are painfully human. Li liberal and conservative both need Jesus. Both are missing the mark. Both are, are comprised of sinful people making decisions, I, I think, uh, often that are unjust. Both sides. We work for the politics of our neighborhood and our city. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit. We are empowered by, by Jesus, who is the good and final king. I want to finish with Jeremiah 29. Uh, I think Jeremiah 29 calls us into a beautiful biblical vision of how we should live out politics. I mean, you really want to know my answer. This is the verse. What should you do? How do you engage in politics? Live this out. Jeremiah 29. Starting in verse 5, it says, Build houses and settle down. You want to get political? Do that. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. 
Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. Be in the city. Be present. Hope for good in the city. Vote for good in the city. But, I, but this last line about lies being prophesied from the diviners and, and the, the fake prophets. I think we need to listen to this. This to me is us right now. Like don't, don't give in to the lies of, of the false gods that surround us, that those things will save us. There's lies being prophesied around us uh, so much right now. If you just do this, if you just vote that, then everything will be set right again. No. Look to God. Give to God what is God's and, and put Caesar back in his place. This is how to be political. We pray for the politics of heaven to invade earth. We fix our eyes on Jesus and we ignore the lies of, of the lesser gods that are, that are being preached to us constantly, preaching to us to worship and bow down. And so I, I just want to end with this for you to go into your groups with today. How does this begin to shape the specifics of how you think about engaging in politics today, maybe, maybe uh, how you vote, how you should be active in your community. How does this, some of what we've talked about today, potentially shape how you should engage with politics? Mm -hmm.